Up to this point, we've looked at smokeless powders more or less in isolation. Now, though, we reach the point where powder is just one constituent of ammunition. And this is where everything starts affecting everything else. By the time we get to the assembly stage, three other components come into play and all sorts of other variables start emerging. Variables to do with brass, such as thickness, number of times fired and trimmed, concentricity and crimp. Then there are the variables to do with bullet weight, profile, seating depth and other factors regarding how well they will fly. And not forgetting variables relating to primers, their make, seating depth and burn heat. Primers can affect the pressure inside a cartridge by several thousand psi. The importance of powder can't be overstated, but ultimately everything is interconnected and powder is just one ingredient. And that's before we get to the firearm itself. To construct safe and accurate cartridges, everything needs to be as consistent as possible. We want a nice steady pressure curve that peaks at just the right moment. So where do we begin? As a novice reloader, it's often best to start with just one or two calibers and work on them until you get to a certain proficiency. Straight walled cases are much easier than bottleneck types. Take 44 Magnum, for example. The 44 Remington Magnum is a rimmed cartridge, meaning that it has a projecting flange at its base. Contrast this with rimless cartridges like this 45 ACP round. Rimless cases don't have a projecting flange. The base is flush with or smaller than the diameter of the case wall. There are other kinds, but these two are the most common. Being of large internal volume, the 44 Magnum is easy to cater for and can be used in everything from light plinking loads and right up to hunting elk and black bear. And of course, there are plenty of firearms chambered for it. Thanks to Dirty Harry, this cartridge has acquired something of a reputation. But like all ammunition, it's only as powerful as its fuel supply. I regularly make light 44 Magnum loads which are less energetic than a 9mm. There's no reason why you shouldn't begin by reloading shouldered calibers. They're just a little more challenging for beginners. 308 Winchester is a typical rimless shouldered cartridge. It and the almost but not quite identical 7.62 NATO are widely used in target shooting, police and military applications. Over the years, the 308 Winchester has become the most popular big game hunting cartridge in the world. It can accept a wide range of bullets and is suitable for at least a dozen different powders. Okay, what about handling powders? First of all, keep the bench clean and tidy. Only have out items relevant to what you're making. As you would when driving a car, make sure you're fully alert not distracted by anything, and especially not angry or upset. If the kids are pestering you, then load your ammo after they've gone to bed. If the dog needs to go out, deal with that before starting to load. And if you've got a mouse... Come on, we talked about this, didn't we? Of all the things that can go wrong when loading, the most serious oversights are double charging a case or not charging it at all. If undetected, both situations are potentially dangerous. Once you have a certain number of cases charged, inspect them from above. This will at least eliminate the danger of a case with no powder. Double charges can be harder to detect, especially in shouldered cases with lighter loads. This is where concentration reigns supreme. Reloading is repetitive and that repetition can lead to a loss of concentration and thus mistakes. Try and avoid interruptions, but if something does take you away from the bench, be sure you know which was the last piece of brass you worked on and write down or perhaps even photograph what you were doing. A mammoth session is not a great idea. Take regular breaks, but do so at a point where you know precisely what's been done and what's left to do. Making good ammunition requires good equipment. Get the best you can afford. 
Oddly enough, there isn't too much I can say about choosing powders. That's down to the type of gun you have, the intended purpose of the loads, and the reloading books that you consult. However, the key is consistency. A good powder dispenser can deliver a measured charge with one-tenth of a grain accuracy. If you get powder floating about and sticking to the sides, that's static and can be mitigated by wiping the outside of the reservoir with a damp cloth. Shooters talk about powders metering well or badly according to how they behave when dispensed. Some powders can be a bit cussed, but decent hoppers have a very close-fitting drum that can cut through any stuck kernels. The worst offenders, as you'll see in a moment, are stick powders. Even though everything fits tightly, it will still take a bit more effort to slice through the tougher types of kernels. To be honest though, all types of powders have their idiosyncrasies. Another important thing is that the person doing the loading also has to be consistent in the way they handle their equipment. For instance, if you tap the handle on the upstroke, do so every time. However you dispense your powder, make sure you also have one of these, a balance scale. They're simple in design and thus tend to be very accurate. I use mine to check what my hopper is throwing every 10 or 15 rounds. There's a lot of choice out there regarding equipment. Discuss your needs with reloaders you know and trust and listen to their recommendations. Then go away and read up about it before buying. I've said before that we should consult more than one source when developing a load. This is because there's variability between reloading manuals so do your homework, read more than one book, and be safe. Sometimes, no matter how experienced you are, things just will go wrong with your loads. In one of the earlier parts, you saw me using a Russian Mosin Nagant carbine. On that day, I had a couple of misfires, rounds which either didn't work at all, or squibbed, meaning that the bullet left the case but didn't leave the barrel. This is one of them you can see that most of the powder didn't burn. Some of it must have ignited because it's discoloured and clumped, but this round didn't fire. It turned out I'd contaminated the powder charge, probably with sizing lube. I'd either used too much spray and or not waited long enough for it to dry. Earlier in this series, I referred to the dangers of very light loads in large volume cases. Over the years, there have been reports of guns exploding when ammunition has been loaded in this way. Propellant powders release energy by deflagration, rapid subsonic burning. Detonation is a supersonic process in high explosives. A shockwave, usually from a detonator cap or booster charge, propagates through the compound, causing the explosive to release its energy. Smokeless powders don't usually detonate, but there is something called a deflagration to detonation transition, or DDT, which can take place under certain conditions. DDTs can occur in gas pipelines and other confined spaces where what starts as rapid burning can build up excess pressure at the flame front. This becomes a supersonic shockwave, causing a powerful explosion. But confinement doesn't have to involve a container. Sometimes, due to sheer quantity, energetic materials can self-confine and transition from burning to detonation. An example of this was the Port of Beirut explosion in 2020, when 2,755 tonnes of ammonium nitrate ignited and then detonated. For nitro powders, research into DDT has found that, depending on how they are initiated, smokeless powders can indeed detonate, especially ones with a higher nitroglycerin content. So there is a glimmer of light there, but frustratingly no indications about possible DDTs in ammunition. Concerning ammunition, the detonation debate focuses on how a small quantity of powder can transition from burning to detonation inside a brass cartridge case. 
and that's where the research tends to hit a brick wall. Unfortunately, the phenomenon of ammunition detonation is so elusive it's been impossible to replicate in a laboratory setting. So very little is understood about why it might occur and there is no expert consensus. All I can do here is present some of the hypotheses about what might be happening. When using light loads in cases of any size, accidental doubling becomes a real possibility. Visual inspection is key, or if doubt persists, even weighing the finished cartridges. It's thought that quite a few alleged detonations may actually just be explosions caused by undetected double charges. Another idea is that because a small powder charge can move about inside the case, it may end up piled against the bullet, acting as a kind of obstruction or all going off at once. Equally, some argue that a small charge of powder lying horizontally may present more surface area for ignition, with similar results. Still another argument is that having all the powder a long distance from the primer might lead to failed or incomplete ignition. The bullet leaves the case but gets stuck just past the chamber. If this goes undetected by the shooter, the next bullet slams into the obstruction, causing an explosion. One hypothesis posits that a pressure wave or series of them might propagate inside a cartridge and then somehow coalesce and go supersonic. This one gets debated a fair amount on internet forums but hasn't so far been demonstrated in a controlled experiment. Ultimately, we don't really know why detonation might occur. It could be any of the above reasons, or none of them. Some shooters have tried to lower the cost of reloading by using a smaller charge of something faster than recommended by their books. Going cheap like this is a recipe for disaster, because the result can be an abrupt pressure peak, with the chamber rupturing before the bullet can even leave the case. So, what about the future? We've been using smokeless powders for almost 150 years now. Rather like the modern automobile, which owes its existence to methods developed in Henry Ford's day, powder technology has been developed, refined, adapted and tuned. But it still clings to its origins, those two energetics, nitrocellulose and nitroglycerin. We live in a time when the spotlight on technology and its impact on the environment has never been stronger. The use of lead ammunition has already fallen under scrutiny and a slow transition to non-toxic formats is now underway. How long might it be before powders go the same way? I'm no futurologist, but I'd hazard that if environmental lobbying doesn't bring about the demise of traditional ammunition, then technological advancement might. Military weapons technology has long been drifting in rather futuristic directions, to areas where propellants have little or no role at all. However, civilian shooting has always played its part in preserving the history of firearms and ammunition. It seems to me unlikely that gun clubs might one day be using ray guns instead of traditional firearms. The sense of history would be lost, and the challenge of producing accuracy by manipulating variables would become boringly redundant with nearly every shot burning a neat hole into the bullseye. What I do sense though is that the margin of refinement that can be added to smokeless powder is becoming increasingly slender and that economics, especially in the current climate, may become the key motivator of change. Whatever happens, I hope we'll always be able to appreciate the long and checkered history of firearms propellants and keep alive the memory of some of the quirky figures who helped bring about today's nitro powders.